We'll be in Matthew 13 together this morning as we continue our exposition of the book of Matthew. We're going to start about six weeks together looking at Jesus' parables. So this morning, I want to answer a fairly simple question, and that is, what is the purpose of Jesus' parables? Now, I don't answer that question because I'm curious about it. It's not the way we preach around here. I answer that question because the question is posed to Jesus by his disciples in the middle of this chapter. In fact, two different times, Jesus speaks specifically to the purpose of his parables, to the question of why is he teaching in parables? So we're going to study together in particular Matthew chapter 13, verses 10 to 17, and then verses 34 and 35. But before we read those verses together and pray for God's help, I want to give you a little bit of background and talk about parables generally. So let's start in Matthew 13, verse 1. Chapter 12, details what scholars have called Jesus' very busy day. Matthew does not write in strictly chronological order at times, but if we look at all the different time markers for the things that happened in Matthew 12, as well as comparing Luke, what we realize is that this is sort of a representative day in Jesus' uh, ministry, and it was a long and busy day, sun up to sundown. And what we see in chapter 13, verse 1, is that same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea and great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat down and the whole crowd stood on the beach and he told them many things in parables. Now, just a few weeks ago, we saw that Jesus withdrew briefly At times, he would withdraw to be by himself, perhaps for an afternoon. Often in the wee hours of the morning, he would escape the crush of the crowds. Jesus is about two years into his earthly ministry at this point. And there were times when he would step back for for prayer and time with just the disciples. But he has come now back into the throng, and he is teaching them. And this crowd presses so tightly that it becomes difficult to get around. This crowd is moving in toward Jesus. It's probably hard to teach. And so what we see here in verse 2 is that Jesus got into a boat on the shore of the sea and they pushed out a little ways. So perhaps he was 20 feet, 30 feet, 40 feet out in a little boat. Um, They would have anchored and he sat down. Now this was common in those days. In our day, teachers tend to stand up and uh, students sit down. In that time, Teachers often sat down and the crowd stood up. So this is reflective of the day. Jesus just chose to do this in a boat because the crowd kept pressing in. People wanted to touch him because Jesus was healing people in public, it would seem, frequently on a daily basis. So to avoid this, Jesus pushes out, sits in the boat. The crowd comes around him. Perhaps they found a place on the beach that was a bit curved even. You know, when Whitfield was preaching in the, in the colonies to great crowds, Benjamin Franklin went to hear him preach, but Benjamin Franklin was no Christian. He did not have eyes to see or ears to hear. So rather than listen to the gospel as um, Whitfield pressed it home to the hearts of the hearers, Franklin was out on the edges of the crowd, stepping it off and measuring and doing mental calculations. And he wrote about this later in his journal and said that... um, Whitfield, without the aid of any amplification, because there were no amplifiers then, he said Whitfield could have preached to a crowd in the open air of of more than 30,000 people. His vocal projection was so good. It's well documented. So how many were in this crowd with Jesus? We don't know. But so many that it was a hard crowd to teach to. And so Jesus is in a boat seated just off the shore teaching this massive uh, throng. And what we see, verse 3, is that he told them many things in parables. So before we read our text for this morning, I want to tell you a little bit about parables. You can jump down to Matthew 13, 10. The disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? So that's a biblical question that Jesus answers and Matthew answers. And so we will answer that together this morning. I'll tell you just a few things first. The meaning of the word translated parable is to place beside. 
Uh, that word comes to us directly from the Greek word. Um, it, it's just two words put together that mean to place beside. In fact, it refers just to making a comparison for the purpose of illustration. Here is one thing. Here is another to help you understand this one. Your English teachers talked about a simile. That's a comparison using like or as. And that's what a parable is in story form. A parable is a simile in the form of a short, memorable story designed to illustrate spiritual truth. That's it. A parable is a simile in the form of a short story It's designed to be um, memorable to illustrate spiritual truth. Usually, parables are sketches of everyday life, ordinary objects that are placed alongside eternally significant truth. That not only helps us to understand them quickly, but it also helps us to apply eternally significant truth to the regular details of our lives. This is no head-in-the-clouds sort of truth. God's Word applies to the regular things that we do all day. Well, Jesus, who is steeped in Old Testament truth, rightly and freshly applied, and, and being a master storyteller and preacher, uses parables in a striking, almost, almost electric way. He taught like no one before had ever taught, and the crowds couldn't get enough of it. Many were outraged at him. Many heard him gladly, but no one in the crowd was coolly indifferent. Jesus' teaching was too pointed for that. This brings us to the effect of a parable. I want to say this. I have read in books on preaching, I have read in commentaries, people saying that a parable is simply an illustration. It's just designed, Jesus was such a good and kind teacher, I wanted everyone to be able to understand, so he used simple stories. That's what a parable is for. Well, there is some truth in that, but that is so little of the truth that it really confuses the matter. A parable is designed to do so much more than that, and in at least one sense, the opposite of that. So we need to dig in. What is the effect of a parable? Well, it's helpful here to think about light, right? An illustration is like light being shined on a subject to help us see it more clearly. Well, a parable powerfully and vividly shines the light of truth concerning God's work in Christ unto salvation. And as I say, by using these everyday stories and scenarios of relatable people and things, we can see ourselves relative to this truth and how this truth impacts our lives. This is Jesus using stories to shine light brightly on the hearts of people. Well, things react to light in two different ways, don't they? Think about this. Light is is a powerful, powerful force on the face of the earth. Everything reacts to light. Creatures of the light love and seek the light. I've said this before. Look up time-lapse videos of flowers. It's astonishing. Fields full of certain types of flowers, they go to sleep at night. You can't make this stuff up. And then when the sun comes up, they pick their little heads up, and they're facing the east. And and then they track with the sun. They rotate a fair number of degrees, and and then their head goes down as the sun goes down, and they reset. Look, things of the light, things that depend on the light, love the light, seek the light, and follow the light. We have two pet turtles. They come up every day, and they sit on their little rocks, and they stretch out their feet and their necks to get as much of the light from their special little turtle lamp as they can get. Um, They love the light. They seek the light. They need the light. If you put a turtle in absolute darkness long enough, I don't suppose it could make it. Um, There's been studies done on this. People need light. Think about creatures of the darkness. Creatures of the darkness hate and avoid the light. Think about a bat. If you see a bat flying around at noon, go inside. (laughs) It has rabies. They do not come out into the light unless there's something desperately wrong. Bats hate the light and avoid the light. 
How about a cockroach? Has this ever happened to you? Have you ever gone out in the house in the middle of the night and you turn on the light maybe to get something in the kitchen and there it is? What does it do? It goes scurrying and you can hear it because all its works are on the outside. And it scurries away with this otherworldly sound that makes your skin crawl. Why? Well, it's a creature of the dark. I don't know, the fall. It's because of the fall. That's why cockroaches. But creatures of the dark hate and avoid the light. A parable is the light focused with intensity. And it produces both results among mankind. This is by design. Two people can hear the same truth and react to it very differently. The Apostle Paul, talking about himself and the other apostles and the gospel that they shared, said this, We are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? The same aroma, Paul says, is a stench to one and a sweet-smelling savor to another. The light is something desirable and beneficial and beautiful to some and something horrible and harmful and hated to others. A parable is simply a focused beam of spiritual light. Keep this in mind as Jesus answers the disciples' questions, why do you teach in parables? Or as we might state it, what is the purpose of Jesus' parables? I'm going to read these verses for you, and then we'll work through three purposes as I see them in the text. Matthew 13, verse 10, then the disciples came to him and said, why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see. And hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled. That says, you will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull. And with their ears, they can barely hear. And their eyes, they have closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly, I say to you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. And down in verse 34, All these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. And this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we stand in desperate need of your help this morning as always. Father, we come to you weak and fallen and broken. We come to you, Father, even as your children, even as those who have been saved by grace. We come to you as those still battling the world, the flesh, and the devil. And we need the work of your Spirit in our hearts and minds to to illuminate the truth of your Word, to help us to understand, to move us to to desire greater obedience in Christ-likeness, and then to empower that obedience. Father, we can do none of that on our own, and so we come to you humbly and ask you to do your work through your word in our hearts and minds this morning. Father, would you do this to make us more like Christ so that we can accomplish your goals in this world for your glory. We pray all of it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Number one, if you are taking notes on the page provided in the table in the back, 
Number one may sound strange. Jesus' parables conceal the truth. Jesus' parables conceal the truth. They are vehicles of judgment. Look again, starting in verse 11, he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. Listen, but to them it has not been given. For the one who has, more will be given. and He'll have an abundance, but from the one who has not, which is to say understanding, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they don't see. And hearing, they don't hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive, for this people's heart is, has grown dull. And with their ears, they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. Now, this is the opposite of what you might expect If you've read the Gospels and you've seen Jesus in public imploring people to come to him, come to me all, he says, all who labor and are heavy laden, then I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. My burden is easy. This is Jesus who's beckoning to the crowds to come and to be saved. But this seems to say that he's teaching in parables to conceal the truth from some. Well, that's a hard saying, so don't take that from me. Let's see if this is anywhere else in Scripture. In fact, let's take a quick look at all four of the Gospels. If this is true, that Jesus' parables conceal the truth, that they are vehicles of judgment, then it ought to be pretty clear. Turn to Mark chapter 4 with me. This is Mark's account of the same instance, Mark chapter 4, verses 10 to 12, where this question is answered in Mark's book. Now, when Jesus was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables so that they may indeed see, but not perceive, and may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven." Mark uses an even stronger construction here. He uses a different word than Matthew. To you it has been given, but for those outside, everything is in parables, so that, in order that, to bring about this result, that they may indeed see but not perceive, may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. Well, wait a minute. What about Luke? Maybe Luke can, make the, can iron this out. It's a tension. Do you feel that tension? Maybe Luke will iron it out for us. Luke chapter 8, verse 9. When his disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Okay, but John is the theological gospel. John is the one that gives theological context to the events of the life of Jesus. So let's see what John does with this. John 12, 37 to 41. John 12, 37 to 41. Surely John will bring his theologian's cap and he will iron this out for us. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. So that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart. Lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. And when you see something stated plainly in all four Gospels, you have one of two choices. You believe it or you reject it. There's not a lot of middle ground on that. But we must dig in and say, but why? 
But what is happening that sounds funny to my ears? It says here, this is about two years into Jesus' ministry, and for this third year it would seem that in no teaching context did Jesus not include parables, and we were just told that the purpose of Jesus' parables is to conceal the truth, at least to some, they're vehicles of judgment. Why? Well, to understand this, we have to go back to Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, because these are the verses that all of the gospel writers are quoting. So turn back with me to Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. This is the culmination of the dramatic call of Isaiah into prophetic ministry. He's given a vision of God on his throne. God's holiness overwhelms him. He falls down. He says, woe is me, I am undone. He is certain that he will be killed by the holiness of God, like someone standing too near the sun, consumed. Um, He said, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. And then an angelic being that would have also been terrifying to Isaiah starts flying toward him and on the way plucks a coal from the altar, and he thinks, yep, I'm going to die, and it just got weird. And yet this angelic being shows up and touches the coal to his lips, the very place where he had become sensitive of his own sin, and says, your sin is atoned for. Your guilt is removed. And then the most amazing thing happens. He hears a voice saying, who will go for us? And Isaiah, I believe, shocked himself by blurting out, here I am, send me. He went from on the floor, certain he was a goner in the presence of a holy God, to saying, here I am, send me. Now, the words that come next probably weren't what he expected. Because the words that come next are God explaining to him the purpose of his mission and what he can expect among his hearers. Now, listen, if your calling into ministry starts like Isaiah's, you are expecting some Billy Graham stuff. You're expecting big tents and stadiums, accolades. Listen to how God describes Isaiah's ministry as Isaiah goes and preaches to the people of Israel. Isaiah 6, 9 and 10, and he said, go and say to this people, Isaiah, here's what you tell them, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy And blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Isaiah is confused too. He says, how long, O Lord? God said, until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people and the land is a desolate waste and the Lord removes people far away and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. Isaiah realizes something in this moment. He's called as a prophet to announce judgment on all those who have rejected Yahweh as God over them. Isaiah is sent to preach the message of God and to preach a message of judgment on all those who have turned away from him in unbelief. You see, in Israel at that time, there were many who had seen the miracles of God worked out among them. They had heard the prophets. They know their history well, and yet they continually set up altars on the high places. You can read about this in history. You can look for archaeological uh, uh, remnants of this. They were setting up idols like all the pagan nations around them that were almost exclusively fertility cults, and they were doing unspeakable things around these statues. And in many cases, child sacrifice was involved. And this is why, by the way, God told them when they inhabited the land to drive all the people out and don't spare them because their quote-unquote worship was wicked, unspeakable perversion and murder. But Israel never did obey God fully in that. And so time and time and time again, they kept taking up this same kind of abomination. And God would plead with them and reach out to them and send prophets and judges and others. And yet they hardened their heart against the voice of God. 
And so to Isaiah's generation, God said, Isaiah, you're going to go and preach what I tell you to preach, but understand these people have already hardened their hearts against me. And the more they hear this message, the more of a hardening effect it's going to have. And this is my act of judgment upon them. You see, God operates in just judgment on the wicked who refuse to repent. Jesus, in his humanity, developed his own understanding of his role as Messiah from the Scriptures. Jesus didn't hit a certain age and then pressed a button and got a download from heaven and his software updated and all of a sudden he was no longer truly human. He now possessed the fullness of his divine mind. No, if you think that, then you've not understood the true humanity of Jesus. Jesus came into a fully orbed understanding of his role as the Messiah by reading the Old Testament. Now, was the Spirit helping him? Of course. Luke goes out of his way to show this. But Jesus had read Isaiah and he knew that he was the final prophet. He knew that he came with a message of salvation, of grace, yes, but that he also came as a representative of God, the just judge. And so he came with a message that furthered that just judgment. And the parables were part of that plan. You see, for those whose hearts were already hardened against God, the parables only made them matter. Jesus, we asked you a question. Okay, well, how about this? Imagine someone finds treasure in a field. Now, Jesus, stop it. Just Now, tell us the truth. Who are you? How about this? Imagine a merchant. And he finds a pearl. Now, come on, Jesus, just shoot straight with us. Get to the point. Well, imagine two sons. And the more he did this, the angrier they got. Because their hearts were not soft toward him. They were not humble. They were not seeking actual understanding from Jesus. They were mocking Jesus. They had made up their minds about Jesus. They had rejected Jesus, and that's because they had already rejected his father. And many were practicing a dead form of Judaism that was not in line with the beautiful Old Testament law as written. And so they came to him with hearts already hardened and predisposed to reject him. And Jesus' parable served as part of God's judgment against them, further hardening their impenitent, unrepentant hearts. And this is the first purpose of the parable. Parables laid out clearly for us in all four Gospels as they quote Isaiah 6, 9 and 10. I'll give you one more example of this and the dynamic that seems to be at play before we move to the second purpose of the parables. Go to the book of Exodus with me. Exodus, we're going to look, we'll start in verse 8. Here we have um, the Jews being led out of Egypt and their slavery. We have the plagues that God is bringing against Egypt. Um, in order to motivate Pharaoh to let the people go. And what we have is this repeated phrase about the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. But something interesting happens here. We need to ask the question, wait a minute, who blinded the eyes of these people in the crowds in Jesus' day? Who stopped up their ears? Who hardened the soil of their heart? Well, maybe we can get a clue about this by looking at Pharaoh, whose heart was hardened as God judged him. Well, how about Exodus chapter 8, verse 15? But when Pharaoh saw that there was a respite, he hardened his heart and would not listen to them, as the Lord had said. Well, there you go. Pharaoh hardened Pharaoh's heart. Whew, well, that one was easy. Good. Oh, wait, I have another verse marked here. Hold on. Verse 19, then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God, but Pharaoh's heart was hardened. More of a passive construction there, isn't it? It seems like someone hardened Pharaoh's heart. What if we go back to the left a page in your Bible to Exodus 7, verse 3, where God says to Moses, But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Now, did God harden Pharaoh's heart? 
or did Pharaoh willingly harden his own heart? And the answer to this, as with the answer to many of my favorite theological questions is, yes. (laughs) Now, how exactly do you justify those two truths? Well, if you can figure that out perfectly, come and talk, because you're the first person in 2,000 years. I would love to hear your perfect explanation as to how God's absolute sovereignty and man's absolute responsibility before him work perfectly together. If you've ironed that out with no more questions, you're the first in 2,000 years, I want to hear what you got to say. (laughs) But what I can say is this, by any definition of sovereignty, either God is sovereign over all or God is not sovereign at all. Otherwise, we have no definition of sovereignty. Did God harden Pharaoh's heart? Yes, he did. But was this against Pharaoh's will? Listen carefully. No, it was not. God has never hardened a single human heart that was not already predisposed to reject him. God has never hardened a heart that was not already hard itself and refusing to repent in humility before God. Our theological systems will get us in trouble in both directions. There are some who are so comfortable with the sovereignty of God that they speak as though man is not accountable before God and held responsible for his moral decisions before God. There are those that are much more comfortable thinking from a, from a man-centered perspective, because that's where we live and how we think, that they stress man's accountability and responsibility before God to the degree that they so de-emphasize God's absolute sovereignty, we begin to have an unbiblical picture. And most theological systems will push us real far in one direction or the other. The Bible would force us, to see both, to affirm both, to confess that we can never understand exactly how they fit together, and to submit there at the foot of the cross, and to rejoice that God is both good and sovereign and saving a vast innumerable host of sinners like us, none of whom deserve his love and grace for an eternity. But understand that when Jesus came preaching, he was fulfilling this role um, of Isaiah, and we will see in a few minutes Asaph, and he was coming with a message of judgment on those who had rejected God and closed their hearts against him. This is part of a mystery. But make no mistake, Jesus' parables do conceal the truth. They are vehicles of judgment for those who will not listen. But number two, just as powerfully, equally, Jesus' parables reveal the truth. They reveal the truth. They are vehicles of grace. Look again at verses 11 and 12. Look again at verses 11 and 12. This makes more sense to us. This we grab hold of more readily and rejoice in. He answered them to you, it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. Look at 12. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. This understanding is something given from God, and for the one who comes and responds in humble faith to the understanding that God has given, guess what? More is given. To the one who opens their heart in submission to God, more understanding is given. To the one who repents of their sins, holds them up into the light in all of their filth and hell-deserving splendor, and says, God, I have done these things and I hate them now. Please forgive me and change me. To the one that comes in repentance and faith, guess what? They are coming with an understanding that has been given by God, and in that moment, more understanding is given. This is the wonderful truth of sanctification before a holy and sovereign God. That the minute we submit our hearts to him and say, God, I will never understand you fully. Of course not. I'm a human, but I believe in you. And I believe in your son and I submit before you in in humility to the things I can't fully understand. The moment we do that, guess what happens? His parables become a focused spotlight 
a searchlight, a lighthouse light that revealed the truth to us with more beautiful detail and, and vivid definition than ever before. They stick in our minds. You can remember a lot more of the parables than the kings of Israel. Because stories stick with us and help us understand the truth. They warm our hearts. They move us to action. These parables are spotlights focused to reveal the truth. They're searchlights designed to find us and lead us home. To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. And to the one who has, more will be given. He'll be given in abundance. Verse 16, Therefore, (laughs) blessed are your eyes, for they see and your ears, for they hear. Many prophets and righteous people longed to see Jesus in action. God come as Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, come in the flesh to teach, to heal, to die on the cross. They longed to see the fulfillment of all the Old Testament promises, Jesus says, but they didn't see it. They wanted to hear what you hear, but they didn't hear it. We have this now in a stronger way, according to Peter. A single eyewitness account is something that's quickly forgotten, easy to get muddled, but a written account breathed out by the Spirit and, uh, and by the Spirit, we are aided in our understanding of it as we come back to it time and time and time and time again. Peter says that this revelation of the glory of God in Christ is greater than what he saw on the top of the mountain of transfiguration when Jesus shone in all his glory. God has given us this light. He's given us his parables that we can enjoy a better and better understanding of him. Matthew eleven twenty five, and following holds this together. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding, that's where we started, and revealed them to little children, those with air quotes who are too wise and too understanding to come humbly to Jesus. Well, then the parables, the format of parable just hides the truth from them all the more gives them over to the rage that they're already in, rejecting Jesus. But you've revealed these things to little children, to those that come humbly and dependently to God through Christ. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. Matthew 19.11 speaks of understanding being given to God's people. Specifically there, talking about marriage, when it comes to accepting God's moral standards as good, instead of raging against God's moral standards as the world does, this is something that can only be given. Matthew 19, 11, not everyone can receive this saying, but only those to whom it is given. This is part of God's gracious enablement for us to see the truth, believe the truth, love the truth. Even when the truth confronts our sin, that in some cases we love so dearly. He opens our eyes to see that we're wrong. Matthew 16, 17 lets us know that to know the true identity of Jesus is a thing given. It's a thing graciously revealed from the Father. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. He has just spoken clearly of the identity of Jesus. But my Father who is in heaven... He's saying he has revealed this to you. You didn't get there, Peter, because you were, you were um, clever enough or smart enough or, or read your Bible enough or passed enough theology tests or overcame enough sins or prayed the right prayer or prayed a certain prayer enough times. No. No, you've understood who I truly am because my Father is good and gracious and he's opened your eyes to see me rightly and truly. 2 Corinthians 3, 14, Paul picks up on this. Their minds were hardened, for to this day when they read the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Parables can help us turn to the Lord. 
both for salvation initially unto the forgiveness of our sins and for greater and greater sanctification. Parables reveal the truth and lead us home. They're beautiful, wonderful, focused light. Parables help the humble and believing to turn more and more toward the Lord. So parables conceal the truth. They're vehicles of judgment for those who reject Christ. Parables reveal the truth. They're vehicles of grace in the lives of all who come in repentance and faith before Him. And finally, Jesus' parables fulfill the truth. I want to end briefly over here in verses 34 and 35. All these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, He said nothing without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. And here He quotes Asaph, who wrote Psalm 78. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. Turn with me there to Psalm 78. It's a wonderful psalm you should read the entirety of this week as you reflect on Jesus teaching in parables before we move into these next six or so weeks. Asaph is writing here, and he's recalling the history of Israel wherein God has come and graciously and miraculously delivered them time and time and time again, sending judges and prophets and others to speak His Word to them plainly. And what do they do? They continually turn away from their good and gracious and sovereign God. And therefore, God judges them because He is a just God, Look at verse 1, give ear, O my people, to my teaching, says Asaph, incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. I believe Jesus consciously saw himself coming in fulfillment of Isaiah's ministry. What Isaiah started, Jesus would finish. Jesus came consciously in the fulfillment of Asaph's ministry. What Asaph started, Jesus would finish. He would fulfill And what Asaph does now from verse 4 on down is he lays out the history of God's gracious work of revealing himself to the Israelites and the Israelites' consistent pattern of rejecting God and turning back to idolatry. And therefore, we come to verses 32 and 33. In spite of all this, they still sinned. Despite his wonders, they did not believe. This is just as true of those in Jesus' day that watched his ministry as it was of those in Isaiah or Asaph's day. In spite of all this, they still sinned. Despite his wonders, they did not believe. So he made their days vanish like a breath and their years in terror. Therefore, God, as a just judge, eventually turned them over to the desire of their heart, which was to remain in sin. And so God allowed them to. He gave them over to that. He justly judged them in part through the preaching of Isaiah, through the preaching of Asaph, and yes, through the preaching of Jesus. He justly condemned all who rejected God's offer of salvation. But the psalm is not over. The psalm is beautiful and balanced. And so turn down to the last stanza of this psalm, starting in verse 67, where Asaph looks to the line of David calling our hearts and minds to all that was promised about David and the king that would come from his line. Despite Israel's consistent history of turning away in sin, God will be faithful to his promise. Look at this. He rejected the tents of Joseph. He did not choose the tribe of Ephraim, but he chose the tribe of Judah. Mount Zion, which he loves, he built his sanctuary like the high heavens, like the earth, which he has founded forever. He chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds, from following the nursing ewes. He brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people, Israel, his inheritance. With upright heart, he shepherded them and guided them with his skillful hand. Do you remember how Matthew started? The opening line of the book of Matthew. Matthew is at pains. The Holy Spirit, through Matthew, wants us to see one and one thing first. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Jesus is the hope 
of Israel and all of the promises made through the Old Testament. And Jesus is the hope of the church of all who will ever be saved throughout all of human history. He is the one who will come from the line of David that will save all of those who stop rejecting Christ and turn to him. One more verse from Psalm 78, how will he do this? He'll do this by offering himself up as a sacrifice. Psalm 78, 38, yet he, being compassionate, atoned for their iniquity and did not destroy them. He restrained his anger often and did not stir up all his wrath. Just as the angel plucked a coal from the altar, that place where sacrifice is made for sin, Jesus went to the altar of the cross and poured out his own blood in sacrifice for the sin of all who will stop their rejection and unbelief and will come in acceptance, repentance, and faith. So the parables, living, vivid, Memorable, they shine the truth of the gospel so brightly that you must respond one way or the other. By the way, if you're here in rejection of Jesus, understand that the more clearly you hear his truth taught over and over, the more you are heaping up for yourself wrath on the last day. Because God justly judges according to uh, what you have been given. Listen carefully over the next six weeks and understand the responsibility of that. You must respond one way or the other. Jesus' parables are used by God as He sovereignly and graciously saves the undeserving who come to Him with nothing but humble faith. And Jesus' parables are used by God as He sovereignly and justly condemns those who stubbornly refuse to repent and believe. God's sovereign work through the parables, as F.P. Dunn has said, comforts those afflicted by sin and afflicts those comfortable with sin. Let me say that again. God's sovereign work through the parables, as F.P. Dunn has said, comforts those afflicted by sin and afflicts those comfortable with sin. So over the next couple of weeks, the light of the gospel is going to shine brightly as we see Jesus' kingdom parables together, and they are amazing. They're so fun to study. They're easy to hear. You'll remember them forever, and the gospel will shine brightly. You must come. And as you hear these kingdom parables, will you come further into the light and receive saving or further sanctifying grace? Or will you shrink back and risk the hardening of your heart until there remains no more hope of repentance? That's the question. Dave read from Isaiah 42. I want to read to you just verse 16. I will lead the blind in a way they do not know. In paths that they have not known, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things I do, and I do not forsake them. The Lord Jesus saves all. All who come to him in repentance and faith. All. He opens the eyes of the blind. He unstops the ears of the deaf. He tills the hard soil of hard hearts. He changes people in an instant and makes them children forever. John 12, 35 and 36, Jesus said, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. So while you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. Come for the next six weeks as we focus this beam of gospel light through the parables on your heart and mind and mine. Let's do this with anticipation of what God will do in and through us. Father, we thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you for the incredible, memorable stories that we are about to hear from the lips of Jesus. Father, many of these stories have become just part of culture. People use them and refer to them not even knowing that they came from the lips of Jesus. Father, I pray that that they would penetrate our hearts and minds even deeper and that we would understand more of you and your love and your grace, more of ourselves and our sin and our need for a Savior. Father, would you teach us much about your kingdom over the coming weeks 
As we look at these parables together, we thank you for the light that you are shining through your word. Would we receive it and be brought out of darkness further and further? We pray all this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.